Paranormal Road has been brought to you by EVP Mediums. Visit us at evpmediums.com, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Exploring unknown regions of our reality. And she looks out and sees these lights in the sky and these different patterns drifting like they were going to land. Examining the depths of human perception. I, I started, I remember when I was awake and I realized I was awake, I started to sort of scan the room and I realized that something was, was wrong. Pursuing the elusive and unseen. Uh, electronics started acting up, ceased to work, overheated. You have just entered a road of wondrous mystery. And so when we get around this bend in the road and this group of trees, we look up in the sky and there's this craft and it is huge. A place where sometimes our darkest terrors dwell. I've never seen anything like this and instantly I could feel the fear. You've just turned on to the Paranormal Road. Paranormal Road. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, ignition, lift off. just taken a detour and headed down the paranormal road. I'm David. And I'm Randy. And folks, tonight we have an exciting show for you. It is absolutely jam-packed, so our intro is going to be a little bit shorter than normal. For those of you familiar with haunted locations in northern Ohio, you know all about the Franklin Castle and its background. Tonight we have on our show William Krejci. He's the co-author of The Haunted Franklin Castle. He is also their resident historian. He knows so much about that castle and the background and the history of the families that have lived there and what's going on. He, he's just a mountain of knowledge. So it's going to be great for you uh, if you're into the Franklin Castle and the history of it because William's going to set the record straight on exactly what happened and, and cut through all the crazy rumors that are out there about, uh, you know, I've heard everything from Nazis to, you know, murders, but he's going to he's gonna give you the straight skinny on, on exactly the details of Franklin Castle. And tonight is actually not the first night that we've talked to William or uh, had a conversation with him. We actually met him a little over a year ago, um, and he's just an incredible wealth of knowledge when it comes to northern Ohio, the history of the land uh, in the towns. Literally, you can bring up, you could say Gore Orphanage, and you know, William's going to be able to tell you facts and figures. You can talk about Putin Bay. You can bring up uh, subjects of downtown Cleveland and, and as far as the trolleys go, and he'll be able to tell you, you know, uh, what deaths occurred on trolleys. He's just an amazing, incredible historian. Great. He's a great researcher. Uh, he can find things out that nobody else can find out through his research, and it makes conversation so interesting with him. Yeah, yeah. You, you could just go on for hours. The show wouldn't have been long enough for us to just cover everything that we wanted to talk with him about. Yeah, and when it comes to shows, um, the show that we did, The Legends of Gore Orphanage, when we, well, first of all, we we post advertisements or blurbs on Facebook about everything. And when we did that for Gore Orphanage, it went viral in a matter of minutes. And the same thing happened when we posted information about uh, Franklin Castle. So it is a subject that everybody is dying to hear. And uh, No pun intended. No pun intended. But tonight, we have an exciting show, so uh, we're going to, like, stream line this introduction and we're going to move right along. We also have William Haddix who has another report that he kind of brought up a little teaser about Project Blue Book and some interesting find on that project. Headline edition July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week 
has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Professional UFO investigator and special assignment reporter for Paranormal Road. It's the Haddocks Report. This is uh, William Haddocks with the Haddocks Report. And as promised, I've got a guest I wanted to bring on. Uh, I know a lot of people have been interested in the show the History Channel recently put out, uh, Project Blue Book, which was an interesting uh, dramatization, so to speak. But I've got a friend on the line here, uh, Rob Mercer, who actually has a connection with uh, Project Blue Book in a way that I don't think you would be able to figure out, so I'm going to bring him on and let him uh, tell his story of his involvement with Project Blue Book. <clears throat> so uh, go ahead uh, whenever you're ready and let him know uh, how you got kind of involved in it. Okay. My name is Rob Mercer. I uh, live over in Springfield, Ohio, a little east of uh, Wright-Patterson, and I started investigating UFOs in 2013 with MUFON. I was always into them my whole life but that particular year I uh, had been searching Craigslist for UFO files but one day back in uh, fall of 2013 I came home from a MUFON meeting over in Columbus and I wasn't ready for bed yet and was up and decided to look on Craigslist which I did from time to time and I just simply put in the search UFOs and that particular day, I had a page uh, ad come up saying that a guy had original Project Blue Book files. Uh, he said he had uh, the ad said he had found them in a garage in Fairborn, and he said they were the property of a general. And that's all I knew. Uh, it was late at night. I sent him a text. The next morning, he got back with me and told me that he still had them, and I was welcome to him if I wanted. So that day after work, I went down to Centerville, Ohio, met him, and he had went in and showed me he had bought a pile of lumber at an auction. And then there that he was picking up the pile of lumber, and there was a wicker basket, like, smashed underneath, a good-sized one. And it was full of binders and a couple boxes of papers, and they all referenced UFOs. Um, he wanted $100 for them right there, and I... They looked authentic to me, so I gave him the money and took them. Came home, done research on them for a couple weeks, and came to the conclusion that though they were from Project Blue Book, more or less with Project Sign and Project Rudd started in 47, 48, there were documents that old all the way up to 69 when Blue Book shut down, but the vast majority were actually late 60s. And a lot of the Names I've seen signed on there in ink were from uh, Lieutenant Carmen Morano. So I uh, used that name as the basis for my search to try to track down where exactly they came from and how he had them. I did searches on um, Fold 3 and at the time the Black Vault, which had the Blue Book files online, and they were very easy to search. And some of the things were in there, so I knew they were real and they were signed in ink, so where I actually had original copies as opposed to some of the stuff that was scanned that you would see on those other sites. I uh, went with, I knew I had actual files there. There were movies, a few uh, 16 millimeter and eight millimeter film clips. There were slides, different items like that in there, along with memos and, and books. So I started with the Carmen Morano name and found out that he had lived in Dayton he had lived in Fairborn. I went with that Fairborn address and found out that a few months prior, they had actually had an auction at the house he lived in. I did a drive down there and looked, and that the guy told me it was a two-story garage, and the stuff was in the attic. And sure enough, this garage had a, an attic above it. You could see with the windows and everything. So I knew I was on to the right place where they had came from. 
so I did a little bit more research on him and found that uh, he had found the number where the people that lived in the house had moved to and tracked down the phone number for them. And a friend of mine, we talked about it and he made a call for me because he had a military background and thought maybe he would break the ice to let him know that I had these files. My goal was I didn't really want to share them until I told him I had them just in case they were stolen. I, you know, of obvious reasons you don't want to get in trouble when you're messing with something from the government. So he made a phone call to the phone number that I tracked down, and it was actually Carmen Morano's wife who told me that he had divorced her. They had gotten a divorce years before, and she gave me – more or less gave us the phone number and told me to feel free to call him where he currently lived out of state. So I made that phone call the next day and he was surprised that I had these files. He told me that when blue book shut down in 69, it was his job to clean everything up, scan everything in, clean out the desk and everything. So as he did that, these boxes that he had were a lot of the items that he had that they showed the press when they would come in. And he thought at the time, yeah, I'll just take those home. Those might be neat to have in the future. And then he, after we talked about UFOs for an hour or so, he told me that he's seen that I was quite interested in them. And he said, you know, back where I st stay in the summer, I've got several more boxes of those if you want them. And I said, sure. He said, call me in about a month and I'll be back home and remind me and I'll send them out to you. So I gave him a month and called him back. And sure enough, he mailed them to me. There were uh, four good-sized boxes of files, photos, like some more film clips, glass slides, a lot of memos, uh, inner office letters, letters from different uh, people in the field, uh, Carl Sagan, a lot of signed things like that in there. And a lot of those can be seen on the Black Vault website. I've put them on there to share with the world. Now, have you kept any of them yourself or uh, still have them, or did you see I, them I else? used them for about four and a half years. I shared them around Ohio. Um, I had a website set up. It became too much for me to take care of. Uh, I eventually, last about a year ago, I sent them to a friend of mine that's got a collection down in New Mexico. His name is David Marler, and uh, he's a serious collector, and he is – and they went there because – they're in the process of being sent to the University of New Mexico for a, a UFO wing that they're putting in their library for people to share. So I, I, I had enough. I, they're, I didn't want to get messed up in my musty basement and figured they'd be better off in a better, drier climate so they could be better preserved and sent there. But I scanned everything digitally, even a, a lot of the books. And you can the and you can go and see those on the Black Vault's website. Now, when I say a lot of the books, there were training manuals. It was the reference, all the reference tools that Project Blue Book used. Like everything that you want to look at, though, you can see on that website. So nothing was ever like edited or blacked out like you normally see in a lot of documents from government. Absolutely nothing. There was uh, no, nothing on there whatsoever. That stuff, you know, before they. They did that after they scanned everything in for the National Archives. But since this stuff was going in the trash, it didn't didn't go on there. Now, I asked the lieutenant, that's what I always called him, about you know what he remembered on any of the cases. When he started out at Blue Book in his early 20s, he was a fan of science fiction. And he told me he believed you know that we were being visited. But after working there for a few years and, and – Keep in mind, they, he had a lot of mundane work. He wasn't so convinced himself. Uh, he never followed the subject when he left. He put this stuff in a box in his attic and never messed with them again. When he moved, somehow he missed that box that led to me finding it. But he said he would eventually just throw them in the trash himself. He didn't have anything else to give them, anybody to. So That would make sense in a way, I guess, because if you... I guess high, you know, higher level military. If you look through that stuff after the fact, and maybe by chance found something, what could you really do? I mean, you know, being that you are you know, like him, being military, you like you couldn't just come right out and say, "Well, I found something in these documents." You know, I'm going to release it because everybody knows who he is. 
you know, and it would be some serious trouble, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Now, he started there in 67, so by that point, Heineck was already a believer, or, you know, had become a believer. He wasn't as much of a skeptic as he had used to be. So, I asked him about Heineck, and he, he said Heineck couldn't identify an airplane taking off a runway. I mean, that was the impression yeah. he had of him. You could see a lot in, in a lot of the memos and that him and Heineck were not friends at all. Uh, he was, I guess you would call, you know, Murano the skeptic to Heineck's, to, to him, you know, believing when he worked there. Oh. And if you look at those memos that I'm talking about, a lot of them didn't make it to Project Blue Book. But in them, you'll see where Heineck Late in, late in the years, was act, act, asking for older files to look at things that had been done and put away. Um, he was <clears throat> into it that way. As, as you could tell he was it already shifted and was trying to find out more information on looking for interesting older cases that he had looked at when he was younger. And you'll see that in a lot of memos that you won't see in the, in the Blue Book archives, which is which is interesting. And there is in those files. I should have added. There's stuff in there that did not make it to the archives, but stuff that is unclassified. There was, uh, I found several slides in there that I've not been able to find anywhere in the Blue Book archives. Heineck's bills that he would send, Wright Patterson, charges for phone calls, charges for travel, and a lot of those were in there. There was a, uh, a, a video, or I'm sorry, a film clip of uh, Hector Quintanilla being interviewed about the Socorro, New Mexico case. There were different notes in the Socorro, New Mexico case that haven't been able to find in the actual Blue Book file. So there were, there's items in there, stuff that people after me will uncover. And I know a few people are actually doing research for me, including John Greenwald with the Black Vault. He just put out a book about with a chapter in it about those. He's actually done a lot of research that surprised me because I didn't have the time to mess with right. it. It took me... A, several years just to scan it all in one page at a time with that much and organize it with that many documents and things it's almost impossible for one man to sit down and look through it unless you can devote like a full-time job to it and even then it, i think would be very difficult but doing like you did sending it off to where it can be part of a an archive at the university there'll be enough people there that can take bits and pieces of it and go through it and probably uncover things that you didn't even realize was in it yourself. Yeah. They, and that's what people are always finding that. There were a few in there. If a report would come in for a UFO and it was in another city, they would have the local Air Force base do the investigating, which was, that was common. But they, I found a few in there that were actually with Air Force investigator, especially one in Florida, where he would just trash witnesses on the reports and one of them in particular and you'll find it on that site where it was actually air force personnel that made us a, a sighting report and he just if you would hear the way he talked to him called them imbeciles and everything you'd see why a lot of them didn't want to mess with even take the time to, to file a report right it was there was definitely a lot of scrutiny and not a positive experience by any means oh yeah and something else i found that it was I thought was pretty neat in there, and I didn't discover it until close to the end. <clears throat> was a handwritten letter from uh, 1920, from the, sometime in the 1920s. It never had a, an exact date, but I believe it was early 20s. And he was out in Phoenix, Arizona, and had a report, which is the oldest report I found in there. <clears throat> now I found mentions of that. They didn't actually, obviously, do a report. It got sent to. Blue Book in the late 60s, the guy rewrote the letter, but he was describing a report from the 20s. That's what it was. And that report's not in Blue Book whatsoever. Like I say it's just a handwritten letter. But I have found mentions of it in, in different magazines, of, uh, another publication from back in the 80s where somebody had found the story. Not from They couldn't have found it from Blue Book. They had got it from a different source. But I thought that was, you know, it was a there's little gems like that were hidden inside of there. But yeah, it's definitely an interesting uh, subject, and it's you can pick out any time period or segments you want, and you can spend a lifetime just on that 
small, you know, little snippet of UFO history. Yeah, but, I agree. And after having those files, I mean, it is my opinion that Blue Book was a front just to keep people off the government's back and let them know they were investigating. I mean, every once in a while, something fell through the cracks, like the Socorro, New Mexico case in 1964, or a few other ones where they didn't have control of it, you know what I mean, where it got out and more <clears throat> more publicity than they expected. Right, like giving a but baby... beyond that... Like giving a baby a pacifier, you know, it doesn't solve yep. the problem, but it keeps them quiet. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, if you read it, you, you see a lot of stuff like that. The lieutenant wasn't even allowed to leave Dayton and go investigate anything. He had to do everything he did from a desk. And that would be so. pretty difficult, especially <clears throat> then, because there wasn't, you know, the internet and all the tools we have today to right. look into things, so that would make it more difficult and more likely that there was a lot of incorrect uh, outcomes. Well, that's because, true. And maybe not any fault of his own, he just from the lack of tools that he had. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, coming on the, the show and letting everybody hear your story. I thought it was pretty interesting. Like I said, the timing kind of fit pretty well with Blue Book wrapping up their first season and working on a second season they they had no intentions i guess originally but with so much of the public liking the show so that's always good i guess in a way to get more of the public at least talking about the subject yep well if anybody wants to know anything more about them they can find 99 percent of what i scanned in on the black vault.com on their website where they can email me at uh Miami Valley UFOs. It's mvufos at gmail dot com, and I can personally let them know if I have anything. If they're looking for something on a particular subject, particular case, I let them know if I have. Every, I didn't have every file, obviously. There's twelve thousand some cases, <clears throat> but I had probably a six foot stack of papers that were a loose mess when I got them, but I got in a pretty good order that had a lot in them. And uh, if anybody has anything to uh, add uh, comment wise or anything concerning the show uh, you can message paranormal road through facebook and if you got anything uh concerning me directly or if you want to leave a sighting report uh feel free to go to central ohio ufo reporting center dot us all the links are there for the youtube channel as well as my facebook page so feel free to use any of those that you need to to message me, and I will be in touch within 24 hours, as long as I have a good uh, contact info so I can get in touch. Uh, and that's pretty much all I've got for the time being. So as always, stay safe and keep looking up. And it's time for a break. When we return, we will be turning back the hands of time to get to the real truth of what happened at Franklin Castle with resident historian William Crashey.
Don't let the negativity of today's world get you sidetracked from your life's journey. Visit It's Your Journey Metaphysical Store at 4750 Cleveland Road East in Huron, Ohio. It's Your Journey is more than a store. It's a place of healing and knowledge. It's Your Journey carries a wide variety of healing crystals and protection stones, salt lamps, books, incense, candles, essential oils, and more. It's Your Journey also offers Reiki, energy healing, personal readings, spirit releasement, and soul retrieval. Live out of the area? No problem. Visit It's Your Journey's website at itsyourjourney.com and shop online. Shipping available worldwide or call 419-433-0888. Don't let negative energy stop you. Take charge. It's your journey. Good evening, everybody, or morning or afternoon or whatever. It doesn't matter. We are Graveyard Tales. Now, if you like ghost stories, hauntings, cryptid encounters, and the weird history behind them, then you should join us in the graveyard. You can find us on any of your favorite podcast providers. Check out our website at graveyardpodcast.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at GRV. I just go search Graveyard Tales. That would be easier. Now, we hope to see you in the graveyard. Back to Paranormal Road, where we are so excited to have William Krejci. He's the co-author of Haunted Franklin Castle. He's also done some other great books, where he's the author of Buried Beneath Cleveland, Haunted Putin Bay, and for a lot of people who don't know, he has three books: Jack Sullivan Mysteries. I'm certain. Awesome, and welcome, welcome to the William. Paranormal Road. Thank We're going to call you Bill. We're going to be a Bill little works, more... <laughs> yeah, Bill, yeah, Bill's a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, Bill, Bill and my friends, you know. Okay, I'm, good. Well, I'm not hope, books, so... <laughs> hopefully, we're, hopefully we're on that status. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank it, you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, no like, problem. You know. It's it's great to get you here. And, you know, we're, we're talking about some of our hometown stuff here. Mm. Cleveland area, we, you know, being in the paranormal field, we absolutely love hearing anything about the Franklin Castle. And, and that's just it. It's it's amazing in Northern, it's, you know, it's ranked among the top 10 most haunted places in the world. Yeah. But when you're in Northern Ohio, especially in the Cleveland area, oh, have you gone by uh, Franklin Castle? Have you seen Franklin Castle? And for us as paranormal investigators, people, two questions we get asked. Have you done Mansfield Prison? Mm -hmm. And have you been to Franklin Castle? Yeah. Over and over. So Everybody wants to know that. And we mm -hmm. are the lucky ones that we have 
the resident historian for the Franklin Castle. On our show. <laughs> talking about it. So we're going to get the real stories about what yeah. goes on at Franklin Castle. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is one of the, uh, one of the most iconic, uh, uh, structures in Cleveland. I mean, of course, you've got, uh, Terminal Tower and you've got Progressive Field and, uh, what not, even the West Side Market. But then when it comes down to anything related to paranormal, the first thing, especially here in Ohio, then mm-hmm. the first things that anybody gravitates towards is, course the Franklin, Franklin Castle. Castle absolutely besides being beautiful yeah. it's a beautiful beautiful home it is yeah and it's it's unfortunate though it's it's a very misunderstood home too uh, it's gotten uh, it's sort of gotten this uh, this reputation about it of all these murders and uh, this this uh, this monstrous uh, tyrant of a father that built the house uh, mm-hmm. and uh, all these uh, stories of uh, Nazi uh, spying during World War II and mass executions and all that and and so much of that isn't true especially the part about the man who built the house being this monstrous patriarch and they accuse him of killing his family members and whatnot or yeah. driving you know his wife to drinking and uh whatnot so yeah a lot of that just isn't true though but um does that mean it's not haunted no absolutely not no it, <laughs> it is i will attest to the fact that it is um when they say it's one of the most haunted houses in the united states or even the world by far one of the most in ohio it i have to say yeah it is no, I, we cannot I, wait to hear these stories absolutely. down the road here how, how exactly did you get involved with the owners or with being a part of Franklin Castle. How did that all come about? I mean, well, I'll go, I'll go back very, very far here to, uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm giving away my age to about 1980 or 81 when I was about five years old. Um, Youngster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really. yeah oh yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm in my forties at this point. I, yeah. They say middle age, mid, middle age. So mm-hmm. I'm like, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. I guess I yeah, live to be 87 or 88. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. My, yeah. Well, um, when I was about five, my uh, my family were driving back from my grandparents' house. They lived over on West Forty First Street in Cleveland, about a, a almost a mile south of uh, our, of the Franklin Castle. And my dad and mom thought it'd be a good idea to take the scenic route home back to Avon Lake, that being along the shoreway, and then mm-hmm. down Clifton Boulevard and take Lake Road. So when we uh, pull up to the light at West Forty Fourth and Franklin, right there in Ohio City. My dad said, we're all piled in the van. My dad says, hey, kids, look, that's a real haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> For my dad to say something as profound as that, I mean, this guy, I mean, he never, you know, he never even talked. We never talked, like, about, like, church or God or Jesus at home mm-hmm. or anything, although we, you know, we're Catholic. Um, but for my dad to suddenly say, hey, that's a real haunted house, I'm like, well, okay, he, that must be true. Because and little did you know that. <laughs> I had, well, it's funny because I, I said, oh, I'm going to live there one day. Wow. And my parents are like, sure, after you hit the a multi-million dollar lottery <laughs> which i think back then was only four million but yeah. um, so anyway it began this interest in this house and i thought this is one of the coolest places in the world that this is a real haunted house right here in cleveland and i'm like this is fantastic it's so beautiful too and it's so mysterious because this was back when the whole house was covered in soot and it was very mm-hmm. black from yeah. all those years of you know the cleveland steel mills all that stuff going in there and just built up this real dark appearance to the exterior which made it all that creepy oh yeah sure it did yeah i mean eventually somebody sandblasted it which you're not supposed to do to sandstone but it's a power wash but no uh, but that was many years ago um so it really was this intriguing house. It was just so fascinating. And this was like the first real haunted house that I knew of. And one of my favorite movies growing up, of course, was Poltergeist. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that's when I first found out that there was such a thing as a paranormal investigator. And I'm like, well, people actually do this. And, <laughs> and then, I, of course, you really don't get paid for it. It would be really nice. You know, on um, Poltergeist, that, that lady that comes? Yeah. That's our Randy. That, okay. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Lesh. I, I, I'm the one that really... says, yeah, this house is clean. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I never oh, say oh, that. The, oh, the Tangina Barons. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. you meant Dr. Lesh, who's sitting there and the next morning. <laughs> no, no, Her no, no. and uh, Joe Beth Williams right. have already drank down <laughs> no, that, that flask no, of whiskey. No, I'm the little squeezy like, one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was really into all this when I, was, when I was quite young. And I, you know, anytime there would be a newspaper article about the Franklin Castle or they'd cover it on the news around Halloween or even PM Magazine, I think, did a story on it one time. You guys remember that show or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was like, it was always featured on these great shows. And I would start accumulating a little bit more knowledge about it. And then somebody wrote a book called Haunted Heartland. And there was a brief chapter on it called. 
house of evil, unfortunately, <laughs> but oh, um, that's what yeah. they had uh, referred to. And of course, that was one of the first stories that gave all this misinformation about the house, about Hannes Tiedemann being a murderer and everything else. Um, Hannes Tiedemann, incidentally, that's the name of the man that built the house. Uh, he was the first owner. Um, it was uh, uh, shortly after that, around 1992, I was asked to do a uh, project for one of my speech writing classes in high school. I uh, went to Avon Lake. So for that, it had to be on like some historic subject. So I chose Franklin Castle and started doing some research. And um, after the project was done, I was done with the assignment. I just didn't stop. And I kept <laughs> going from there. Of course, along the way, you know, you start find your friends start telling you about other haunted locations in the area. You start coming to find mm-hmm. out about Gore Finage or about a witch's grave out in uh, Olmstead Falls. So you start hearing all these other stories that start building along the way, and it just it really instills a uh, interest in you as you grow up, and you, you 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 set yourself on this course to find the truth. So that went on for a number of years. I uh, kept finding a little bit more here, a little bit more there. Two thousand five. Uh, Beth Richards and Chuck Gove had the uh, Haunted Cleveland tours, and I with the uh, uh, went along on a tour with my brother, my sister-in-law, and my friend Andy, and it was a gift from my sister-in-law's birthday gift. So uh, we went on this, and one of the stops was the Franklin Castle, and I couldn't believe mm-hmm. we're going to go inside this <laughs> house. I'm like, oh my goodness, we're going to go inside. So we did. We went inside, saw the first two floors. And it was just fascinating. So after the tour was over, I was talking to Beth, and I said, well, you know, I, I do have quite a bit of information on it. And she said, well, hey, if you'd be interested in sharing some of that, that'd be great. And I said, okay, that we, that would be wonderful. So I went to uh, the Natural History Museum, or Natural History Museum, the uh, uh, Western Reserve Historical Society. And I asked them, because I wanted to see how much more I can find. I asked them what they had on it. They said, well, let's go find out. And they brought down a photocopy of a newspaper article. And that's that was all it? Had. Yeah, that's all they had. Uh-huh. So wow. they said, well, we'd be interested if you're writing up on, on it. We'd love to have something about it. And I'm like, sure, okay. And meanwhile, I have like genealogies of the families that live there, including the family that built it, the Tiedemann family. Uh, so I find myself over at the uh, Cuyahoga County Archives. And while uh, doing research over there, I went to use a photocopier, and somebody had left some papers in there, and I pulled them out and asked Glenda, the lady who ran the place, I said, um, you know, somebody left these in the photocopier. She said, that's Mr. Myers in the next room. So I went to go hand them to him. I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. And I read it, and it's the last will and testament of Hannes Tiedemann. Wow. Uh, John Myers, wow, who I met that cool. day, was also working on the Franklin Castle just for his own uh, just for his own curiosities. Uh, we pooled our resources, and in a few years we had a book, which interestingly got originally was rejected by our by the company that did publish it. Darn. But that was it was Those because people. it was close to a hundred thousand words, and <laughs> they only published uh, books thirty five to forty two thousand. But they gave yeah. us eventually an exception and said nice. they can go with fifty four thousand on that one. So there's that synchronicity in action again. Things yeah. happen for a reason. We talk right? about that like all the time. It's very that it's, things happen for a reason. People's paths. Us meeting with you through. Shelley up at Putin Bay. That, mm-hmm. yeah, that's where I, yeah, your summer gig yeah. in Putin Bay, that, and, and right. who do you run into but Shelley? Uh, yeah, that was funny. And then after about a year, we got in contact with each yep. other again. Yeah, and and again. it's like so, back and forth. Yeah. And then we start the podcast. It's like, wow, we got to get all the help and yeah. talk to him about his books. This and, is fantastic. Well, as far as actually getting involved with the way the house is now, um, the uh, the oh, the current owners. Uh, it's owned by a, a limited liability company called mm-hmm. Odeer Productions, and uh, the they were they were doing some work on the restoration. They're laying laying a new uh, utility line in the backyard, and while they were digging, um, they so to speak they they kind of ran into a wall. They hit a wall while they were doing their work. Uh, literally hit a wall like a buried literally. wall in the yeah. backyard. <laughs> um, so they reached out to a, a, a local historian named Jim DeBelco, uh, so a good friend of mine and a very, very devoted historian. I mean, he is good. He finds things that you wouldn't believe. Uh, but they reached out to Jim because he wrote the article for the Cleveland Historical Site, and it was really the true history of the house. And they asked him if he might know what this was. He said he didn't, but he had an idea who wouldn't. He referred me. Uh, because he and I had shared a number of uh, uh, bits of information about the house, and I'd been doing the work so long, so I was invited to meet up with him and the mm-hmm. new owners at the at the house. 
And we uh, checked out the foundation in the bay, and it was a foundation of a house. And it turns out I was able to determine that it was the foundation of the first house to stand on the site. And a lot of people don't know that, that wow. the Franklin Castle is the second house to stand there. Mm, the first house, yeah, the first house was built between 1859 and 1861 by four brothers from Canada named Wolverton. They came to Cleveland to get an education. Uh, the oldest was around 19, I believe, and the youngest was about 13 or 14 at the time. And they built a house on the site that they lovingly called Bachelor's Hall. It was a two-story <laughs> wooden home. Well, the four of them. Yeah. And, and I read that in the book. Yeah, and that was kind of cool. Was their, uh, was their housekeeper. She lived with them also. Um, so they had this house, and the house is what, nine, in uh, 1865, after the war was over, that the uh, oldest surviving Wolverton brother, unfortunately, two of them did not survive the war. Uh, the uh, oldest surviving one uh, was Alonzo Wolverton in 1865, sold that house to Hannes and Louise Tiedemann couple from Germany. Uh, they had, at this point, a son, and they were expecting a second child who would be a daughter that they named Emma. Now, Emma comes into the lore of the house many years later. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was. So it turns out that this was the foundation of Bachelor's Hall. Um, so the uh, the owners, they, they, uh, that's how we first met, was through was through that. And I uh, got to see the restoration, and it was uh, they're just doing such a fantastic job. I will never be able to say enough good things about yeah. the the ideas that they have for the house or the crew that is working on this house. I mean, just fantastic. Now, how many years did it sit sit, sit vacant? Okay, it was uh, it was hit by a fire in uh, November of 1999, and that was uh, only about a half a year after the last owner, Michelle Heinberger, had purchased mm -hmm. the house. Uh, unfortunately, somebody did break in and uh, they set the house on oh. fire. Now. The as I understand it, uh, uh, the insurance that she had was enough to cover the uh, uh, the house to save the roof and put a new roof on it um, mm -hmm. and prevent any further damage from occurring to the house. Uh, but then uh, in the next few years, uh, there was a gentleman that came in. He had the idea of turning it into a private social club, like a city club, and unfortunately his plans never really came to fruition. And so to the point that in 2011, uh, Michelle Heinberger, who still owned the house, sold it mm -hmm. to uh, the current uh, owners, the limited liability company that owns it now. Um, so from then, uh, they were able to start the restoration within a couple of years on that. Uh, so uh, for what we're looking at over 10 years of it sitting sort of vacant and yeah. derelict. That in a house or any building without heat or electricity, the cold, the, the yeah. heat. Uh, takes such a toll on the mm -hmm. interior, and it's really, I, I, I think it's fantastic that uh, it's being restored. I think yeah. that anybody who restores buildings like that deserves kudos because yeah, it's applause. a lot of work and it's a lot of yeah. painstaking, and you know, to revive something back to mm -hmm. what it was. I think also, <clears throat> didn't I see something where when the Tiedemans bought it, didn't they like? make a major reconstruction or, or add it on or did something to it? That's the, Yeah, that's one of the uh, legends of the house was it, the, the original story says that they purchased or that they that they're the ones that built the house in 1860. It's not true. It was built by these four brothers, young right. men from Canada. Um, but but the, the, in the 1880s, the house was largely altered and converted to look like this spooky old castle structure. Uh, that's not true either. Uh, so the story said that it was done to take Mrs. Tiedemann's mind off the sudden death of numerous children in the family. There were not numerous children that died at this time. Um, they had three children that died in infancy between the years 1863 and 1873, mm. spaced out over the course of 10 years. That was fairly common, unfortunately, right. back then. And they were from uh, fairly common childhood ailments at the time. Well, they were originally buried over in Monroe Street Cemetery on Cleveland's west side. Now, and that was that was in their uh, Mr. Tiedemann's uh, brother-in-law, Gaston G. Allen's uh, family plot. He's a famous uh, prominent mason from Cleveland who the Lodge in Lakewood was named after. Um, this being the reason for them being buried there is at the time Mr. and Mrs. Tiedemann did not have enough money for burials, at least when the first child was buried, so they continued to bury the next two children there. In 1881, Mr. and Mrs. Tiedemann did lose their daughter, Emma. She was 15 years old. She died from diabetes. Mm. She was not insane or, as some of the stories say, right. it's not true. Um, then a few months later, Mr. Tiedemann's mother passed away, but not at the castle. She passed away over on West 47th Street at Gaston G. Allen and his wife, Katharina Tiedemann Allen's house. Uh, 
But then in 1883, where the story of these three children mysteriously dying then comes from, is in 1883, Mr. Tiedemann had those three children who were originally buried in Monroe Street Cemetery moved to the new family plot at Riverside where Emma and his mother Vibka were buried. So that's where that comes in. Now, the story of them greatly altering the house, well, this would be the greatest alteration of all. They tore down Bachelor's Hall in <laughs> and they built a new house on the site. If you look at Emma Tiedemann's obituary from January of 1881, she was buried out of the home. That's where they had the funeral from. Mm-hmm. They didn't use funeral homes at the time. It was always in the front parlor. Right. So the address stayed the same. It was 283 Franklin Boulevard. That was the original address of Bachelor's Hall. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that happened, after they had Emma buried over at Riverside Cemetery, they tore down that house. And this is evident in the 1881 Cleveland City Atlas, where it actually shows the plans on every property and it shows what buildings are standing and what they're made of and how many stories they are. That map shows no house on that structure only a barn in the back, which later on was torn down also to make way for the carriage house that's Mm -hmm. behind there. So we know that the house was finished around 1883 because that's when the Tiedemann family moves back in. And that's also, if you look at the county tax assessor's records, Mm -hmm. that's where the property value went from being originally about $800 in 1881 down to about fifty dollars <laughs> and then upwards of about five thousand dollars after wow. in eighteen eighty three. Right. So you're seeing this just sudden spike or so of a few right. thousand dollars. So that's way how we know that it was completely torn down and the new house was built. Uh so it wasn't where they modified the original house. They they tore it down and built a new one. But during that time, those two years, they were living at a second house out in Lakewood, uh which uh, Mr. Tiedemann did have a name for it. The the, the Franklin Castle, that name didn't come out until the 1960s, uh, when the Romano family moved in, uh, they're the ones that came up with that name. Otherwise, up, up until that point, aside from when it was Eintracht Hall or the clubhouse, which is what the uh, Eintracht Club, the German Socialist Party, had, uh, it was just simply known as the Hannes Tiedemann House. Mm-hmm. What you about the stories your... of, with <clears throat> like hidden rooms and that kind of stuff? Is that okay. is that true or is that? Um, there were a few. You could call them hidden rooms. Well, uh, see near the front door, there's a sliding panel that matches in very well with the re- surrounding panel. And that simply leads to a small staircase that goes down to the servants' quarters. This way, the servant can answer the front door without uh, disturbing the rest of the house. There were on the fourth floor, the top floor of the house, uh, there were a few passages, uh, one very well known that went off of the ballroom and that went into a passage uh, that paralleled the ballroom, another one on the other side of the room, but there was a door that you could walk through to get to it, so it wasn't really hidden. The other way that it went would take you out to this thing called the Musician's Gallery that overlooked the stairwell right there. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was in the house was that there was a trap door in the floor of that top floor, that fourth floor, and that dropped down into a space that ran between the third and the fourth floors, and it went back into a space. And that was just for storing steamer trunks and whatnot. Hmm. But that was original in the house. There was a carving in there, and I believe it said Tom Smith. I believe that the year, it says 82, I think. And that's not 1982, that's 1882. Mm-hmm. And that appears in the original 1970s tour book that the uh, um, Sam Muscatello and his group had for the house. And I have a copy of it. And it describes this, this trapdoor in this little space in between the floors there. And there's a talk about what's carved in there. So, uh, and that was in the 1970s, so it was prior to 1982. So, unfortunately, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, an owner after uh, Sam Muscatello and the uh, uh, current owners uh, had that ripped out and tore that out of there for mm. some reason. We don't know why. Um, but yeah, the, but those are the uh, those are the spaces that had... Now, there are still spaces in the house that kind of go between things. And I even heard recently at a uh, talk that I was giving just last weekend, somebody said that, I believe she said it was her husband, was a member of the Eintracht Club, and that where one of the back chimneys uh, ran, it's still there, um, but the chimney is sealed up. They had knocked out the back and there was a space and there was like, it was quick access to drop down from the third floor to the back and you could run out the back if you needed to, <laughs> to escape. It was like, it was like a runway. It was like a, a, a way to get between get the floors. Now I don't know. I know what it is now. It's a wet wall. The toilets butt up against them. Uh-huh. So yeah. So I know that, um, I know it was at least used for that, but whether or not it's still, uh, there's still anything in there, or if it really was used for that purpose, I don't know. But I, I can see that though. That would be very interesting. I'm sure there's there. a lot of yeah. uh, stories throughout the years that crop up about things 
And speaking about stories and the misconceptions about Franklin Castles, yeah. what are some of the most ridiculous, wildest things that you have heard and, and that people believe? Well, the, wild, the wildest stories as far as the back stories go are the stories that, of course, that um, Mr. Tiedemann uh, had killed all these people, mm -hmm. uh, family members, and he, he had even driven his wife to uh, drinking herself to death and that she was miserably depressed, uh, that he had uh, killed a servant girl uh, named Rachel and that he had killed a niece named Karen who he had according to the story says he had caught her in bed with one of his grandsons the the, the of course I'd, I'd said the story about the three yeah. children um, that he actually had moved in 1883 and the story about Emma uh, she was unfortunately a diabetic but the story about Rachel and Karen neither of them ever existed Wow. You know, Rachel was, the story of Rachel, uh, that she was a servant girl, and she was also his mistress. And on her wedding day, she had found another bone on her wedding day. She had refused his advances, and so he strangled her, and then he made it look like a suicide and hung her from a beam or a rafter in one of those hidden passages next to the ballroom. Then there was the story of Karen that the thing is, neither of those people existed. They were made up around 1980 by a woman named Eleanor Bernstein, who was a self-proclaimed medium who was living at the castle, who was giving these uh, tours at the time for Mr. Mercetta, who was the owner at the time. But she was writing a book called the, the Haunting of the Franklin Castle. And she had claimed in this book that uh, the ghost of Hannes Tiedemann was visiting her every night and telling her where he murdered this person and that person. Up until that point, Mr. Tiedemann had never harmed a fly. But she wrote about this and she... Uh, Sensationalism. Gave, uh, to one of the yeah. newspapers in, the, in, in Cleveland, uh, the, uh, the press, I believe, she had um, given an uh, interview about this. And so that's where instantly Mr. Tiedemann became a murderer Villain. of people that yeah. never even existed. Well, I'll tell you, if, if the house wasn't haunted up until that point, if yeah. I was Mr. Tiedemann, I'd be back and I would be pissed. Yeah, I'd be and, pissed and, too. Well, I mean, that's really terrible when you really think about it. The stories of many locations, not just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Franklin Castle, but that people would turn something like yeah. this. Uh, you know, I, 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 if, I, you know, I think that she was very hung up on the uh, book The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, uh, which, of course, recently everyone saw that, whatever they did on Netflix. Okay, right. read the story, read the actual book, because it falls in line almost exactly with what she was saying about Hannes Tiedemann. Now, here's the thing. They also uh, say that according to his obituary, he died suddenly of a stroke while walking through the park and uh, lived every member of his family and had died alone as if God himself struck him down. Well, that's a bunch of horse crap yeah. also, <laughs> uh, because I've got every copy of his obituary and nowhere in his obituary does it say that he died at home surrounded by his family he had a lot of grandchildren six mm -hmm. grandchildren a uh, son-in-law and a daughter-in-law and his second wife he was still married to her despite what stories say um, but here's the thing though while doing the research for this book managed to track down a number of living descendants and wow. they were and you know what when they found out what this woman had written about their great-grandfather mm -hmm. they were pissed yeah I mean they were through the roof then, of course, you get into the stories about the mass execution of Nazis. Um, that's right. not true either. And honestly, I heard yeah. that as, a, as a you know, God, years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that's, I heard that yeah, story. That's another one that starts off as a newspaper article. When the Romano family, shortly after they moved in, uh, Mr. Romano uh, was quoted in the newspapers talking about a bar that was in the house, left over from the uh, Eintracht Club that owned it, that he was removing some buckshot from it and said that they must have had some wild parties up here. So somehow a buckshot being embedded <laughs> in a bar went to a mass execution in a hidden <laughs> room wow. up on that floor. How stories um, grow. <laughs> yeah. Now, now some of the later ghost stories, though, about uh, from the Romano family from their time there about them seeing a girl in white and even stories of a woman in black. Now, those are true. Those are not wild stories. And uh, they even said that it happened more than just the one time. So, And that's their story as well. Um, well, not even getting into my own stories yet. Even. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and that's what we we definitely want to want to hear those stories because mm -hmm. you know everybody loves a good you know true haunted story and and that to actually have you sitting here in our studio, a, you know, a resident of the Franklin Castle, uh, folks, you're hearing it straight from the source here now. Someone who is living there who can tell you what his experiences are. And we're going to get into those when we return on the Paranormal Road.
If you're into the paranormal, the weird, the unexplained, tune in to the new hit radio talk show on Odyssey Internet Radio, Paranormal Road. Every Tuesday evening at 8 p.m., Dave and Randy explore various paranormal topics with featured guests and audience stories. Have you had a paranormal experience? Crossed paths with the dogman? Experienced a haunting? Owned a haunted object? Or perhaps had a UFO encounter? If you have had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on Paranormal Road, please contact us. Send us an email outlining your experience and be sure to include your contact information. Our email contact information is podcast at evpmediums.com. Again, podcast at evpmediums.com. Welcome back. You just turned on to the Paranormal Road again, and we are really excited because we get to hear first-hand accounts of the Franklin Castle and your experience. Bill, I, I tell you, I'm waiting here with bated breath. I want to hear some of your stories. Okay, well, um, let, let me start off by saying that uh, um, I have never seen a ghost in my life. Not not anywhere. Um, not even when I would go down to a Prospect Place down in Trinley. Um, I had things happen, but um, actually seeing a physical apparition, a person walking down the hallway or walking past me, I've never seen that. Mm-hmm. However, and, and keeping that in mind, um, when uh, first going to the castle, um, kind of a skeptic at the time uh didn't really you know i've I've had things happen you know but um as far as like this place actually being haunted i'm thinking you know how much of this your logical mind is like no how much of it is is hype uh a few about a little less than a week after moving and i had uh, my brother and a few friends over um just for a couple drinks upstairs um and we were walking up the stairs from the uh, side entrance to the main floor and it felt like I had gotten stung by a bee, and uh, that hmm. me and bees don't go well together. Okay, I have a bad hmm. reaction, uh, so I'm in pain right on my leg, and I'm I'm hobbling up the stairs. My brother's with me. We go up into my room. I take off my pants and shake them out, and I'm half expecting to see uh, like a, a bee, a dying bee, fall out of my pants. And the reason I'm thinking the bee is one, that's exactly what it feels like, and two, there's a garden right next to the castle, um, uh, right right uh, the first yeah. property to the uh, west. And in the back there, right up alongside the fence, a lot of people don't realize this, there's an apiary. So there's a mm. there's a beehive right there that they keep bees over there. And so it's funny to watch people when they <laughs> try to like, uh, get close to the castle and go over there. And then you start seeing them getting stung by swarm. <laughs> Undesirables bees. could be yeah, detoured yeah, by yeah, there. Uh, so don't go in the garden next door, okay? Good, bad idea to go in there. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. But we look and there's nothing there. And within about one minute, I'm perfectly fine. I'm right as rain. I have no idea what that pain was. About an hour, hour and a half later, uh, my sister-in-law, my friend Andy, uh, were coming up the stairs. They just stepped outside to have a cigarette, and when they reached about the same spot, Andy's uh, cell phone, his Pandora, started playing at the same spot. Now, that's something very funny, is, is whatever is in the house has an affinity for Pandora radio. Hmm. So I've got, I've got a second cell phone, and I had hooked up to some speakers, and uh, this is the first winter uh, staying at the house. Um Turn, went out to have a couple drinks with my friends over at Max uh, McMurray's, and I turn out the lamp, and I you know, turn the Pandora radio off and go out. A couple hours later, I come home, lights turned on, Pandora radio is playing, <laughs> and I have a, a hammer dulcimer station I listen to. I love uh, dulcimer music, and so that's playing early American music, and I'm like, okay, you got an hour, and I'm turning it off. I wow. upstairs, and an hour later, I came down and go outside and have a cigarette. I don't smoke anymore, just to clarify, but... Um, uh, I come downstairs and it's uh, it's turned off. The radio is off and the lamp is off. So that was like wow. the first notable actual incident was uh, was that. That's cool. Yeah, but then things really started kind of picking up. Now uh, a common thing that's reported is the sound of somebody walking back and forth on that top floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I kind of stay on the floor below that. Um, and on many occasions, 
Yeah, you'll hear somebody walking around. Now, there's a difference between a window rattling, which sounds... Or floorboards are creaking. Yeah, or the radiator kicking on, which is... And it gets fast. This is... Boom, 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 boom. Somebody. Wow. Then a minute later, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> now this happens frequently. As recently as a few nights ago, was woke up woke up to hearing this. Um, now you don't get unnerved by this not, not, worrying not about not intruders normally, no. or. Well, okay. Now that now that's that's the one thing. Yeah. See, a lot of times it's lights turning on and off, or a door will open and then slam, and that's that can be a little. Uh, unsettling. Um, just a few nights ago, I heard what sounded like somebody standing. You know how like someone's trying to stand still and not be noticed, like when they're standing in a room. But every few minutes, you hear something the floor creak or mm-hmm. something like. Mm-hmm. So that happens, or you hear somebody running up and down the stairs, occasionally giggling or something, or you hear talking coming from part of the house, and you think it's maybe somebody outside, but there's right. nobody outside. Um, Sounds like Randy's yeah. house. <laughs> yeah, that happens here all the time. <laughs> no. See now, there, now as far as actually being unsettled, I, I'm. I'm I've not been scared. Um, the only time I think I'm ever going to get scared is if I like get like fully attacked or shoved down the stairs or <laughs> wake up with some hideous ghoul over my head going, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> scaring the daylights out of me. But um, the, the one time I did get the unnerved extremely was um, uh, that first winter staying in the house. Uh, I was uh, there's a, there's an office on the second floor um, and it's original to the house. Well, we well it's what we say the first floor, but it's the second level of the house. Um, and that office, it's a glassed-in room, all trimmed out in Redwood, uh, and that's, um, uh, right now it's being used by Norton Records uh, as their office, but that's the room that I was sitting in doing a lot of the writing for the Franklin Castle book, the uh, initial edits, and so it's a little surreal being in Mr. Tiedemann's office, yeah. finishing up the book about him and <laughs> his house, uh, and I, the light comes on in the hallway, and there are motion sensors, but I have to actually be in the hallway for that to turn on, so it just kind of turns on automatically. And I'm okay. That's fine. And then, you know, a little bit later, turn, a few minutes turns off. And then a few minutes after that, there's this loud crashing sound downstairs. First thought: somebody just came into the house. Mm-hmm. So I grab the nearest thing, and it's one of those Jesus candles. And I'm like, well, that's not going to help. So I put that down, and I grab the fire extinguisher, figuring, okay, I'll blast him in the face with you know, and then, yeah. you know chemical, and then bash him in the head. Yeah. So I go downstairs. And I'm like, all right, come on up. I see you, and you know I'm checking the door, and the door is still locked. All the doors are locked, um, and I don't see anything. And at this time, there's no light, no lights running to the front uh, of the uh, lowest level, so I can't see anything out of the ordinary. I go back upstairs. An hour later, that light comes back on again, and I'm like, okay, and you know, a little unsettled. And then a few minutes later, I hear that crash again, another crashing sound. And I run downstairs, come out, you mother effer, and you know. <laughs> I see you. Of course, I don't see anything. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, I'm thinking of somebody broke a window, or and pulled one of the bars off and got in, or something like that. So I'm just, I'm just out of my skin a little bit here. So I called my friend Matt, who lives on the next street, and I've known him for years. I say, "Hey, Matt, what are you doing?" He's like, "I'm at the bar drinking." I'm like, "Good. You want to come over? There's some really cool activity here. You might get to hear something." So he's like, "Oh uh, yeah, I gotta bring my buddy." I'm like. Yeah, sure. So him and his friend stop off, get a six pack of beer, and we go upstairs. We're hanging out in my kitchen. We're drinking some beer for about an hour. And of course, now that there's somebody nothing else there, happens. nothing happens. Yeah, so, right. Um, so about an hour later, his friend is like, his friend's got to go. So yeah, we walk downstairs and we go out the side. And Matt walks his buddy down to the end of the gate to let him out. And I sit there by the side door and I light up a cigarette and. I look to my right and I can look in the window and I'm like looking across the room in there and I can see out the front window and I'm like, wow, I can see right down 44th. Why can I see it on 44th? That window is boarded up. So when that comes back, I put out my cigarette, we go inside and we got our cell phones and put our little flashlights on and I'm like, son of a gun. That board that was covering that window is now lying in the middle of the room, about eight to ten feet away from where it ought to be. This is a four by eight sheet of plywood that was yeah. against it. This is clear across the room. Meanwhile, what was in that, where that is now, there was a six foot high step ladder that was set up and open. That's now lying clear across to the northern end of the room, far like to the far end, about another ten or twelve feet away, lying on its side. Was that your crashing noise? That was my two crashing noises. That's all it could have been. Now the window that was boarded up. Yeah. 
Well, it wasn't. Somebody, it, had, it had a board leaning against it, but that board was okay. leaning like. But the window yeah, was still in, intact. Yeah. Oh yeah, the window so, was still okay. intact, and there's bars over the windows. None of the windows were broken. None of the bars were okay. taken off. No, oh, that yeah. nobody. And it wasn't there so windy right. that it would have blown. No, that piece no, of yeah, not not a chance. No, no oh, way. Yeah. Of um, course, I have to try to debunk. Of course, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I would too. That's that's one of those things I can never debunk. The other thing was so that was about the only time it's really unsettled. Um, about a year and a half ago, I had a couple friends over, and it was kind of late, and I went to go lock them out the side, and we heard this loud clanking sound right above us on the stairwell, and we were just walking there a minute ago, and I run up, and there's this big lag screw with, like, an eye bolt, and it's not, like, an old item. It's something it still has a Home Depot label on mm-hmm. it and everything, and there was this about 10-inch long lag screw, this, you know, stainless steel or chrome finish looking thing just lying on the stairs. And it's like, well, where the hell did that come from that wasn't there? There's nowhere it could have fallen from because that's just a ceiling above us. Yeah. They had to have been tossed from somewhere. So that was uh, also a little a little unsettling, but yeah. no, not not actually um, to the point where. Well, I have to ask you, do you think <clears throat> writing the book about it and setting the record straight, do you think they're happy with you? I mean, well, I would, I would, I would hope that. Um, I know that the uh, the descendants of the Tiedemann family are yeah. happy with it, and if it's more than just the spirits of Mrs. Tiedemann and her daughter that haunt the place, uh, well, I would hope so, and I would hope that they got a chance to actually listen to it because um, when John and I were doing the edits, we actually I had him come over and we uh, sat together in the office, and uh, he was saying his eyes aren't that good, well, mine aren't that good either, uh, not anymore, so. We sat there and I read out every single line mm-hmm. and we so made corrections right. off of that. So if anyone's listening and if it is right. a conscious haunting, then I'm sure that they heard the whole story. Um, so I, I would hope so. Yeah. I would hope that. And it I would think, now there. how many winners have you stayed there again? This was my third, yeah. All right. This year is your third? Th- this was my third winner, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't, you know, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be. And um, if they weren't, Happy? <laughs> I think they'd probably. Yeah, I, th- know I think you would have had a lot more uh, terrifying experiences than what yeah, you have. There would be things thrown at me. Well, it's interesting. Um, uh, in uh, just within the last uh, month or so, uh, there's a there's a shop I don't know if you guys are aware of this over in Lakewood that just just opened up called the Cleveland Area Paranormal. Yes. Society. Okay, yes. familiar. Uh, I was in there um, uh, about a month ago, and they sell you know the uh, handbook for the recently deceased from Beetlejuice. Yeah. Um, they sell that up there. Wow. It's, it's a paperback, yeah. and it has and it's it's a notebook. Mm-hmm. So I'm like. I had an idea. I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep a journal of all the paranormal events. That's a good that idea. Happened. So yeah. I put down the day, the date, and the time, and then I write down the events. I started keeping the journal. That of, sounds like know, another books. book in the so, making. Yeah, it might be something that, or when I leave, I'll just like end up leaving it there for whoever the next person uh, <laughs> to carry it yeah, on. Carry it on. They can just keep writing in it yeah. and stuff. So there's oh. your next book. Yeah, I don't know, it's a possibility. Oh. Yeah. But you also have another book that's pretty cool called Buried Beneath Cleveland. Got a couple books. I've got, uh, uh, aside from the mystery novels, yeah, there's a Haunted Put in Bay, which is its own adventure. But yeah, Buried Beneath Cleveland, The Lost Cemeteries of Cuyahoga County. Uh, this was my first work of nonfiction that got published by my current uh, publisher. And in that book, it took me about a year and a half to do the research. I found over 50 cemeteries in Cuyahoga County alone that have been either forgotten about or built over. Uh, you'd be surprised. Some of them have uh, gas stations, grocery mm-hmm. stores, parking lots. Oh uh, some of them are in the woods. Some of them have driveways. Some even have houses built on top of them. Oh, I was no. talking about Poltergeist earlier, that uh, being my favorite movie when I was a kid. That ending just terrified the snot out of me, of yeah. course. But it was like, when I started finding this, that's the first thing that jumped into my head. You move the headstones to you let the bodies down? Yeah. You? And that's so And that true. really and goes on. That really goes on. It goes on a lot more than you think. There are countless I mean, countless, and just in Ohio alone, cemeteries that are sitting on what is now private property, and some of them are old church cemeteries, some of them are uh, little family burial grounds, some of them like larger ones, like the Wagar Cemetery, yeah. which used to be located in downtown Lakewood. That whole cemetery was moved in 1957 to Lakewood Park Cemetery out in Rocky River, but there were a lot of people buried there, and what's there today? Einstein Brothers Bagels over on Detroit between Bell and St. Clair. They have, wow. That's what's on top of it. Um, so I, I bet that's know, haunted. I, well, I don't know. You know I don't wonder. There's a, uh, do, do bagels fly around on their own? Or, <laughs> under, or you get cream cheese whether you want I, it or not? I feel, I feel bad for this one. Whoever the owner, and I'm not going to give the address away, but there's a Nantucket Road townhouses and uh, uh, homes over in a... Uh, 
uh, Rocky River on Spencer and Center Ridge. I feel bad for the people who live over there because that used to be a graveyard too. Mm -hmm. And when they were building the place in 1994, they unearthed a couple of headstones, well, a couple of tombstones. One of them was a headstone fully legible for a woman named Sally Brainerd who died in 1844. Had they dug over a few more feet, they would have found her husband, Enos Brainerd's tombstone. He died three years later. Unreal. They didn't find any remains because they dug down beneath the headstone, which was found face up, and they only dug down to the frost line, three feet. Well, there are two problems with that. One, we don't bury people three feet deep. We bury them six feet deep. Mm -hmm. So they didn't go down far enough. Also, they dug directly underneath the headstone, which was lying face up. Well, that was a headstone, which means that, you know, they dug behind the body and not mm, on yeah. top of it. So there are still people buried there, including a man named William Cunningham. William Cunningham had the distinction of having an island on Lake Erie named after him. Really? Yeah. Until uh, the Kelly brothers bought it. Ah, changed the name. Kelly's uh, Island. It's Kelly's Island. But yeah, the original person who had that island, William Cunningham, he's also he's... buried. He's buried uh, on the southwest corner of Spencer and Center Ridge in Rocky River. Mm. There's a whole cemetery still buried there. That's incredible. They didn't move anybody. Yeah. That's just incredible. So, this is this stuff is so interesting, and, and you have your other book, Haunted Put in Bay. Haunted Put in Bay, uh, yeah, that one uh, that that was a that was a lot of fun to write because it was mainly me doing interviews with people over a few drinks after work on it, so. <laughs> which mainly never happens in yeah, Put in Bay. Never, no. Some of them were well, over at Joe's bar or over at the, the winery. That's the best way and, to yeah. conduct an investigation. It, it, it is the absolute over best cocktails, way. Cocktails, getting these great stories, and even uh even last October, uh, I I led a Haunted Put in Bay bar crawl. I put out a thing and said, hey, it's free. I'm, you got to buy your own drinks. I'm not covering it. <laughs> but we had all told about 100 people that attended uh, because we had people join us halfway through and then leave us, of course. So, But it was well received. I'm, of course, I'm going to do that again this year up there. So you have to let us know about stories. that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I mean, so well, have I you, tell you. Yeah. experienced anything creepy on Putin Bay? On Putin Bay, I, I have. Uh, I, I Tried to. I did keep my own name out of uh, the experiences uh, on the uh, in the book, um, but there's a story that happened at Joe's Bar where a door opened up on its own, and then a patron got up and closed it, and then threw the little latch. Then a few minutes later, the thing came unlatched and opened again. <laughs> that was actually me. That was my own oh. experience. And then there's a, a story of a guy. At what point uh, had you yeah. been drinking? How uh, you know, you know, it was, I was it was fairly early because it was. I remember it was early evening and it was after work, and I, I get out of work at six thirty. So it was. Uh, this was after dinner too. So we're talking. <laughs> Probably about seven thirty quarter days. So it wasn't so one of those still, one-eyed things. Not, a, not okay. an all-day drinking binge. No, this was, uh, and there were other witnesses to it at the time too. There was a bartender. Oh, no, that's a good thing. And a couple other patrons that were nearby would just all kind of like looked at each other. And of course, they hear you know walking around upstairs. But that is one of the oldest. Joe's Bar is one of the oldest buildings on the island. Um, it was originally built as a ice house. So the section of the building that's to the north, it's got the real thick walls. It was all packed with sawdust. That mm -hmm. was a nice house. Meanwhile, the other part of the bar that sits to the south, that's got very thin walls. They're just clapboard siding. You can actually see daylight through those boards. Mm -hmm. That was a press house where they used to press grapes. So for oh, okay. uh, wineries yeah. on the island. But yeah, it's, um, and of course it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt that it's right across the street from the graveyard right there. So you, you're sitting there, you have right. a drink, you look out the window or you're on the back and it's like right there across, the, across, uh, uh, Tab Avenue is uh, Day Rivera, who's the island founder, is his vault, and then the Dollar Vault, and then the, all the old island uh, old timers on the island. But I found some great stuff over so there, it too. Sounds so. like if we make a trip up there, we have the perfect tour guide. Yeah, come on a Monday or Tuesday. It's my day off. So, right. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take you around the island and get the. We might have to call in sick and, that day. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Monday or Tuesday, yeah. and hopefully the boss is not listening. And to I got to say, there, there, there's, <laughs> there's so much more to do on the island, though, besides drinking. Although the drinking is fun. There's, of course, there's. It always uh, adds to Check it out. Yeah, you can go jet skiing, you can rent those, you can go kayaking, it's a lot of fun. Parasailing, of course there's Perry's Monument, I mean you can't pass up on that right. view on a clear day, you can see Cleveland on the clearest of days, you can see all the way to Cleveland, you can see the top of the Key Bank mm -hmm. building, which is about 60 miles away, it's a fantastic view from up there. Uh, but yeah, just so many things to do up there, and uh, there's even the South Bass Island Lighthouse. And you work is, up there too. And I, I do work at Putin bay um, The uh, yeah, I'm Park Ranger uh, on the island uh, for for a national. You monument. do so much. So, yeah, I, well, You're it's also great because into you know, music too. Yeah. I play music, and we have a jam night on the island on Monday <laughs> nights. I get to go take part in that. That's uh, Drew Laplante and uh, Johnny Martin. Those guys host it. They're fan. It's just that's a touch yeah. term. It's just a great place. Weren't overall, you supposed to get you know? some of his music to play. 
Oh, I was yeah, going to, but then we discussed it before, and you know, it's we'll, a little, we'll, uh, yeah, a little. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll risque. See. <laughs> a little risque. Yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them are a little. Well, risque. it is, you know, internet and podcast. No, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is, but this isn't Bob and Tom, so. <laughs> yeah. What are the on Putin Bay? What are some of the, I, I guess. Uh, hauntings you wouldn't expect okay or, um well, there, there are stories from some of my uh, fellow rangers about perry's monument of course mm-hmm. um and also just uh, even at the office over there um the lighthouse that has some fantastic stories what is it with lighthouses? I, you know, I've got to wonder because even the one in Fairport Harbor <laughs> yeah. has stories about it. The one here in, of course, Lorraine. You guys right. did, some, did the investigation uh, yeah, that's, there. And that's yeah. fantastic too. Um, well, this one, the story about the South Bass Island Lighthouse was that uh, a man named Sam Anderson, who was the assistant lighthouse keeper, and he was only there for, like the uh, lighthouse opened in 1897. I believe it was 97, and a year later there was a smallpox outbreak. And he was terrified, very germaphobic. And he, some stories say he got drunk one night. Some say that he was just really terrified. He tried to leave the quarantine zone. Mm-hmm. He got caught, sent back over to the lighthouse. And whether or not he fell or he jumped is still debated. Uh, but either way, they found his remains down on the uh, on the rocks wow. below. Uh, and that's a heck of a drop, uh, but they found him in the lake uh, down below. And the day after, the uh, day or two later, the actual lighthouse keeper, uh, he lost his mind, lost his marbles, and they found him in Sandusky mm-hmm. uh, running around town going on about a racehorse that he owned. And eventually, he was wow. committed to the hospital in Toledo, and he died within the year. Um, uh, stories about a later, uh, a later lighthouse keeper. Um, uh, Mr. Duggan, they say that he mysteriously died uh, and fell off the cliff. That's not true. Mr. Mr. Duggan died from heart failure, so that story is not not true at all. Um, How about, um, and I don't know Nimba, but one of the most to me famous things on Putin Bay is when you're taking the ride in and you see that ship. Uh, um, yeah, the Benson Ford. Yeah, yeah that's mounted the, yeah. right there and turned into an incredible that's house. True. Is are there stories about it being haunted? Not that I've heard. Uh, I do. Know, well, I, I did meet the uh, the one woman. Her and her husband. Uh, they were the ones that originally brought it over, and it was uh, one of those cases of where they weren't going to get permission to bring it over. So it was like, let's do it anyway, and ask. Permission, permission later. later, yeah. yeah it's one of those <laughs> cases. Uh, from what I when I met her, I was um, about five years ago. Uh, um, she was driving a taxi for Westlake Cab, and uh, her and her husband brought it over, and they tried to have it turned into a bed and breakfast, and uh, the island wouldn't go for it. So, yeah. um, uh, eventually, her husband ran into some health problems, and she was forced to sell the house. Uh, but yeah, so but and now she's driving a. Uh, Taxi for where she was when I met her a few years ago. Um, so it's gone through a number of owners. Um, there's a great video uh, that um, uh, Nick James shot, and you can find that one on YouTube. I believe he has it posted and it shows a nice video view of the inside yeah. of the house. It's a beautiful house. Yeah, I saw some of it, and it is really, really cool. Yeah, you know, but I couldn't help but wonder would there not be some sailors that may be, you know, drawn to it and, I, and I, take I, residency I, in it? I have to wonder, and I've, I've heard stories, though, about the uh, William G. Mather now. I've heard that, the Mather Museum. Mm-hmm. I've heard that there are stories about that. And when they moved that in 2005 from East 9th Street to behind the uh, Science Center, I was one of the guys that was on board that shifted it. I was a merchant marine for five years. A lot of people don't, I don't talk too much, but I used mm-hmm. to sail on those freighters on the Great Lakes. Right. One of them was a middle town, um, which became the American Victory, and it was recently decommissioned. And uh, that had that was haunted also. There were a few guys what, that did that one. There's so, yet another book for you, okay? The, uh, the Haunted or ending. Ghost Ships of Lake Erie. Well, you should talk to Charles Cassidy. He's got a he's got a great book about that. Oh. So, yeah, he's, he's somebody you might want to consider. Even we just might yeah. have to do that. Yeah, he's, got a, he's got a great book about you know, the Great Lakes. I hear so many stories about the strange lights and stuff seen over the lake. Have you seen mm-hmm. weird stuff that you just kind of thought, hmm, I wonder? Uh, not, not, um, <laughs> not, not like, not in that sense. No, I, I have seen strange lights, but that was usually after a 12 pack. <laughs> <laughs> although, although my, and a lot uh, of other people saw my, those my, lights too. Were they red was, and blue? You, you know, you know my, my one friend, Jeff, he was walking home from the bar though, and, we're, and he was like, uh, he called me halfway home. He's like, this is weird lights over the lake. And I'm like, looking, I'm like, dude, those are sailboats. No, no, they're flying. They're all moving in the same. I'm like, those are the lights at the top of the mast of the sailboats. It's rough. They're bouncing back. Next morning, he saw me. He's like, 
Don't ever talk about that again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to tell that story. Oh my gosh, and I can't believe our break is our time's up and it's time, time for a break. Again. And time just flies. It sure does. And we will be back in just a few. Stay with us. is proud to announce the Haddock's Report. On special assignment for Paranormal Road, professional UFO investigator William Haddock's will be on our show periodically with breaking UFO-related news around the world. You can expect to be kept up to date on recent sightings, crop circles, cattle mutilations, strange sounds, official government statements, and more. The Haddock's Report, only on Paranormal Road. William Krejci, and uh, he is the live-in historian for the Franklin Castle. And folks, uh, or paranormal investigators that are listening to this podcast, uh, I, I cannot stress enough the importance of treating that that home, that uh, castle, um, with respect. It is not um, it is not public. It is a private re- residence. That's correct. Yeah, and. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners, those that are so curious and, 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 and really want to know all about the Franklin Castle, what they are welcome and not welcome to do, and some of the annoying things you have had to put up with. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I'm more than happy to. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, 
while we do have a lot of people that come over to the uh, to the house, uh, people that pull up outside and take photos, uh, and that that is perfectly welcome. That is, uh, heck, that's encouraged. It's a beautiful house, and mm-hmm. it's it's nice when when people have such an interest. Uh, and if you do happen to catch me and I'm outside, I'm more than happy to tell you about the history of the house. Um, meanwhile, if the owners are there or the carpenters or whoever, they're probably a little busy to do so. Um, so I would be more than happy to uh, do that. I, it's one of the reasons I'm there is to uh, answer questions about the history of the house and the, the legends. Um, what is uh, what is not permitted? Please do not jump the fence. Um, that is not that that is not. That's allowed. not that, cool, no, folks. No, no, don't <laughs> don't do that. jump fences. Um, there's a there's a garden uh, that sits uh, just just to the west of us. That's part of St. Herman's uh, House of Hospitality. That's their property. It's also encouraged that you don't uh, go in there. Um, and there are bees there. There are bees, <laughs> yes, please. There are. There is a beehive over there. Please do not uh, go too close to that. You will uh, most get likely you get stuck. Yeah, for you, going over there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please don't uh, uh, try and jump the fence in the back. Please don't try to break into the carriage house in the back. That's not encouraged either. Um, please, if you are, if you do, even if you do go into that garden next door, which we ask you not to, uh, please don't shine your flashlights into our living room or our bedrooms or <laughs> anything like that. That's also not. Uh, we, we requested you don't do that either. Uh, it's it's funny because there's a there's a website out there that posted something on Facebook or it's been shared on Facebook and it shows a picture of the Franklin Castle and it's it's an old photo from when it was boarded up. It says uh, it's like abandoned whatever America or something and it says a uh, haunted Franklin Castle, the most haunted house in Ohio. Uh, would you break in or something? And it's like, well, you, you know, I saw me. that. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm looking at the re- like <laughs> no. the replies, And I'm like, uh, yeah, guys, uh, the house is not abandoned. It's uh, it's occupied. And uh, when we're not here, there is an alarm that is armed. And uh, uh, let's see, when we are here, we're armed. So don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't whether or not I actually have a gun, I'm not going to say. But um, yeah, but don't yeah, don't try to break into the house. That's not. Don't do that. That's okay? not That's cool. Not, it it no. is a private residence. Right. Uh, also, don't. Um, don't stand, okay, like uh, um, shortly after I moved in, I was having a cup of coffee and a cigarette uh, out on the front balcony. I've learned since don't do that because um, I had some guy uh, out there and he said, hey, can I come in? No. <laughs> um, no. Sure, buddy. No, can I go into your house? I mean, no. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a minister. You know, I want to bless the house. And I'm like, oh, we're all good on blessings for now. You know? <laughs> it's like, no, but no, you but you got to keep up on these things. And uh, I'm like, yeah, all right. And he's like, no, really, I'm a minister. He's like, because there's all been all those murders and there's demons in the house. I'm like, um, no, there, there, there have there been no, no murders. There, there have been no murders and there are no demons. And Oh, okay. He wouldn't let it go, huh? Like, you, you, you saw that online, did you? Because <laughs> it's so true if it's online. And then, uh, uh, and then the and, yeah, that's right. Then it's, yeah, then it's true. Well, this is the exception. Um, but then it's like, oh, he's like, oh, okay. So can I come in? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something you know. You probably go to the backyard you know, now. And yeah, do, do your coffee, right? So, yeah, some. Yeah, so well. Yeah, I, no, I stay inside at this point. And I don't have any reason. I, I don't smoke anymore, so I don't have any reason to go outside. Uh, like I had a balcony right off the bedroom, so I would go out on that. Um, but there's that. I had some guy say, "Hey, yo, I'm your local blogger. You know, and I want to do a pod carry, uh, 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 my own uh, YouTube thing from your from your house." And I had to reply to him, "No, you know, that's, we don't. You know, the, the owners prefer you not to. You know, do it." So I'm out. And I'm doing some yard work a few days later, and this car pulls up, and this guy gets out and says, "Yo, I'm your local blogger. I talked to some guy online. He says I can do a show from here." And I'm wow. like, uh, "No, that was me." And uh, no, you can't. Wow. <laughs> um, no, because yeah, the uh, yeah the owner, yeah the owners prefer you. It's, it's, it's a private residence. Yeah, you, know? you got to remember that. That's uh, that's something that's very important. And that they're going through painstakes to make the, the, it yeah. look really good and yes. to you know bring it back to life. Absolutely. And, you know, respect that. Yeah. If you really, really have the best interest of this gorgeous place at mm-hmm. heart, you'll respect that and you'll go through the proper channels to get to see it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, see, the, yeah, the house has gone through so much uh, between uh, what uh, past, uh, past entities that had owned the house by removing walls or knocking this out or moving that around. And then ultimately in 1999, the fire. And then it sat empty and derelict for so many years now the current owners are doing such a wonderful restoration on the place and bringing it back to life and it's like you know it will be finished 
soon. I'm sure of it. And, the, and really, what they're what they're doing with the house and the work that the carpenters are doing right now, mm-hmm. like these they are just top notch mm-hmm. um, carpenters. They're just doing they're doing a fantastic job. And the idea that the owners have for where they're going with the house and the the design and the way it's going to be set up, it's going to look beautiful. So. So be patient exactly, and, yeah. and, yeah. and, you know, be respectful. Take pictures, of course, share mm-hmm. the pictures. It's a beautiful place. Why not yeah. share it? But be respectful. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's just people and the internet and, yeah. you know, let's, let's, let's build up a, a crazy story and run with it. Well, I, I commend them for their efforts and what they're doing. That's just, uh, yeah. it's wonderful when you see old property being restored and. Especially and, historic places yes, like exactly. that. Yeah. They, they really deserve it. Honestly, if they didn't come in, I would say that uh, if, if, if the current owners didn't buy it and didn't do what they're doing right now, that would probably, the house would probably be a pile of rubble right now. Yeah. It probably would have been knocked down yeah. by now. So. Or it would be a. A Barnum and Bailey show place. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. Somebody bought like it to, that, yeah. to make a circus so, in honor of it. Um, so I'm you know, really happy that it's but, amazing, and we, yeah. we appreciate what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, how can people get a hold of you, or how can people see your but work? First, and, Dave, let's. T- he's got some stuff under his sleeve. He's coming. Oh, I'm sorry. It. He's got a new book. It's mm-hmm. going to be coming out in September, I think you September said? September 16th, the uh, the uh, new book. It's called Ghosts and Legends of Northern Ohio. Uh, what this book is doing is it's uh, it's not... I'm not going to be writing about every little haunted house or ghost story associated with the northern third of the state, mm-hmm. which is... I'm glad that Arcadia History Press has given me such a large area to cover. It's about <laughs> 30 counties, roughly. Um Big. So what I'm going after is actually the the legends that are associated with ghosts with uh, ghost stories. Um, so of course I'll be talking about uh, we all have a story about that crybaby bridge mm-hmm. or that witch's grave or the haunted cemetery or uh, uh, a haunted hotel. So I'll have a few of those in there. And of course you know I'm writing about a number of uh, haunted railroad uh, incidents and some uh, canal ghosts. I got a whole chapter on the old. Canals that traverse the state of Ohio, so there are a number of ghost stories associated with that. And, of course, I'm going to be writing about what's one of the biggest legends, Helltown. Mm-hmm. Everyone goes towards right. Helltown, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, Boston Township. Um, so that's the first chapter. And then what is the other big legend here in northern Ohio? Gore, Gore Orphanage. Orphanage, of course. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that is the last chapter. Uh, did years. This was the only other topic that I really studied at length it's such a long period of time as almost as much as i did the franklin castle i started doing the research on that in 92 uh gorefinage started right around them but wasn't as involved but Mm -hmm. wow the things that you find out um aside from obviously the the cases of abuse and neglect and what went on there and what they were forced to which one of your uh last uh guests to talk about but when you get into the story of the uh headstones uh, there were the gravestone down by the river right found out who that was that is revealed in the book as well as one don't conf- give too much bill not, not, no, no. <laughs> don't give them too much but i will tell you i will say this there is one confirmed death at the orphanage site, and that Fantastic. will be in the book that, as well. So yeah, that, you found that. that th- did find one. How hard was death. that to find? That was that. Well, that took years. Uh, I found oh, it in man. a newspaper article, uh, and I, some of my uh, sources that I use uh, go to the original sources. Uh, mm-hmm. In this case, newspaper articles or the investigation. You get the actual pages from that, and you see what you can find. But uh, newspapers from the actual period are a wonderful resource right. to go back and to go and find when because it's an article that was written the next day and then you find burial information through sites like find a grave and whatnot um or ancestry.com and you find out who the person was that died and you find out where they died and you see who their parents were why were they orphaned what were the circumstances mm-hmm. around that so um so yeah that will be a that one will be out in or i'm sorry september so that's uh that's gonna be a fun and- our plan is to have you back, Bill, if you'll come back. Uh, I'd love to come back, absolutely. And talk yeah. to us more when, when mm-hmm. the book gets out there so that we can actually elaborate on yeah. everything instead of, you know, just yeah. giving the tidbits that we're giving right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. A little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah, it's um, 
it's one that I'm, I've really been looking forward to writing. And even at that, I had to uh, cut a lot of content out. But there are some great stories of some of our, our own local cemeteries. And the Witch's Graves chapter, that's the first one there, the second chapter. And that's, I had a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh, working on that one because it's a little bit beyond what you might think. Now, this is the ghostly legend. So while it's it's covering those legends, it's not going to cover all the legends of North, northern Ohio. So I am, I'm not going to be covering uh, any uh, stories of alien visitation because well, I'm not um, – those aren't ghostly stories. Right. Uh, neither will I be covering any stories about uh, Ohio Sasquatch because I'm, well, I'm not a cryptozoologist right. and, again, not ghostly. So we're going to cover those. You guys, you guys <laughs> not yet. Not <laughs> yet. We're, we're going to pick up where you leave off. The okay? one, and the one thing that I am definitely not covering is the melon head story. Okay? <laughs> right now because I'm sorry the idea of a colony yeah. of hydrocephalic dwarves <laughs> living in the woods near Kirtland. I'm sorry. That's just ridiculous. I want to go now. Despite what your uncle said he saw out there in 1991. Now I don't you, care. I'm sorry. You brought that up. I want to go now. Yeah, yeah, let's go out there and let's go. Yeah, you'll have people hunting for Sasquatch and we'll, we'll be out send there you pictures. hunting That'll for be your melon next book. heads. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's just uh, I bet Sasquatches really would eat melon heads. They, they, well, I don't know. The, the, the melon heads are supposedly cannibalistic, so I get what, do they eat each other? Or do they, <laughs> or do they eat people? I, yeah, I don't know. Or maybe they eat Sasquatch. I don't know. I'm, could be. I, I, would, I would imagine Sasquatch would probably be uh, omnivore, so yeah. <laughs> most apes are, I this might be a whole nother show for us. <laughs> yeah. Without giving too much away of your mm -hmm. upcoming book, yeah. uh, on these legends, mm -hmm. is there one particular one, you don't have to name it, you could just say yes or no, <laughs> is there any um, anything that you were shocked to find out that there was, was there one that had more line of truth than all the others, or what? Well, or did you find massive discrepancies in all of them? I found a lot of discrepancies in many of them, but there were stories like, um, like there's a there's a great story about one of the railroad ghost stories is the uh, ghost story of Jimmy Welsh, a headless uh, headless spirit uh, that was uh, killed out near Arcadia, Ohio. Um, and, and he's been written about numerous times. The ghost of Jimmy Welsh. Well, I found out that mm -hmm. who he really was. I found his name was John Welsh, not Jimmy. And I found out where his family was from and everything. So I found things like that. But in even uh, Wolfinger Cemetery uh, up near Toledo, mm -hmm. supposedly haunted by these three children that all died within a couple weeks of each other. And they're all buried there in one, one grave. But there's no family name for them. Just their first names, middle initial, date of birth, date of death. No surname. That is strange. I found out who they are. That will be revealed in the book. Oh, I found wow. a couple of forgotten ghost stories. There is a canal uh, over in the northwest part of the state. The uh, um, that's the uh, Miami and Ohio Canal. Uh, and that's that runs over the but from Toledo down towards uh, Cincinnati. I found a ghost story about that place. It's called Buckland's Lock. And even another story over in uh, Clinton, Ohio, on the old Ohio and Lake Erie Canal. Mm -hmm. And the Ohio and Erie Canal, there's a story of a old sawmill that used to sit next to the guard lock in Clinton that was haunted by the man who built it. And that story hasn't been spoken of since the 1880s. So these are some forgotten ghost stories that will be in there as well. Wow. Um, one of my favorites was the Akron Civic Theater, which is supposedly haunted by a woman in, a woman who commits suicide by jumping into the canal, a well-dressed man uh, up in the balcony, and a janitor named Fred. Hmm. Well, none of those people, to the best of our knowledge, existed. <laughs> However, I did find that a number of accidental drownings and a few suicides did occur at the lock at the canal right there at, at, mm -hmm. at where the Civic is now, but also in 1900, a few years, a number of years before the civic theater was built there was a race riot and there were two kids that were killed during the right on the site right in front so wow. so you got to wonder who really haunts some of these places mm -hmm. now it's i can't sit there and say i'm not going to say that a place is haunted or it's not haunted you can no more prove than debunk as in my opinion right. um but the taking the story and saying oh well this uh, lock is haunted by a little boy named jimmy who died in 1850 well while we can't find any evidence of jimmy ever existing there was a little girl that died there in 1876, and here's a newspaper article, and here's what it says. So mm -hmm. don't go there asking, hey, Jimmy, are you here? But say, Miranda, are you here? You know, right. So here's the real set so it's it, a lot of reveal. Set it straight, yeah. And that's what it yeah, is. That's so a, that's, that's what a lot great. of this will be. So all that's those great fantastic. stories about witches' graves, um, not what you think. <laughs> um, 
there, there, it, there are witches' graves in Ohio. I will tell you that, and you'll find out a little bit about that in the book. Oh, I can't wait! Uh, and you will also find out about those crybaby bridges. I think everybody has a. I think every state bridge. does. <laughs> what, I, what I really love is the ones who are like, "Oh yeah, it's this covered bridge," and she threw. Her, and, you know how the hell did she throw a child off the side of a covered bridge <laughs> if it's even covered on the sides? Yeah, she climbed, covered for she a climbed up on the roof and went up there, and then chucked the baby over the side. But she cut a hole in it. We know, it, and all the stories are the same. They're all, oh, yeah, back in the early 1800s, this mother threw her child into there. I'm like, wow, it must have been one hell of a time to be a baby back in the early <laughs> right, right. hundreds. You know, How did anyone become kids, adult when all know? were lobbed off of yeah, the bridge? So, so you really, when you find out, but I did find some real cases of that. So And some of those bridges that are yeah. straight, there are actual events that happened at some of those bridges, and those will all be revealed in this, uh, in this book. So. One of the great things about interviewing with you is that you have found some incredible things and just talking to you is just, it's like enlightening to hear yes. about all these things that just, you know, everybody has to get his books and you have <laughs> to read about it. It's so interesting. How can you pass it up? And Bill, how do they do that? How do they get your books? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, you can find them uh, in, uh, at, well, any uh, area bookstore carries. Uh, carries in. Otherwise, uh, you can find them in dumpsters, secondhand bookstores. <laughs> uh, so, so that sort of thing. No, I, but you can also I, get actually, them on, I got, on Amazon. I got uh, I got one at uh, Barnes & Noble at Crocker yeah. Park. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. get them there. Uh, they carry them at Books A Million. Uh, I do occasionally I do signings at Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. And uh, there's a um, number of local uh, bookstores, of course, I'll go We've seen you. Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. I Amazon. actually saw your book in Giant Eagle. And yes, you can <laughs> you can get a couple of them in the Giant Eagle. I, I doubt that I want to say your stuff is way. grocery store, but but no, it is. It's it's grocery but store. But it's, it's good that you're everywhere. Club and yeah, it's. <laughs> It's it's all over. It's well represented. Right. Um, of course, I also have a you know Facebook and you know, and then I've got a website, uh, WilliamGCraychi.com, and uh, there are links to the books you can buy there, and they'll take you to Amazon mostly. Um, but also, um, I've got you know links to uh, uh, past well interviews, and this will be added, of course, mm -hmm. on there. And then uh, also, um, you know, some upcoming stories. Like I talk a little bit about the upcoming book, and uh, also um, your upcoming. Yeah, I play music uh, up at Point Base, so occasionally I put uh, on my um, events page. I'll say if I'm playing a show, or if I'm doing a talk, or a book signing, uh, or both in some cases. So that'll all be um, listed on the website as well. So when are you going to write a song about the Franklin Castle. Now that would be that, that's a challenge. That, that would be a very long song. Well, you saw how long the book yeah. was. So I don't know. What do you? That say would be a that? real drunk yeah. if you're doing it at a bar. Yeah, By the time be, you get to the end of the song, everyone would be passed out. Well, one of the one songs that I get requested a lot of is See, to play "Rock of the Edmund Fitzgerald," and that song it's like 25 minutes. Yeah, no, it's not 25 minutes. So you have to come up with yeah, something and a song that's funny and incorporate. Um, I was sitting on the balcony. Hey, Mister, can I come in? Yeah, there was, there was, that, that would be yeah, that would be pretty funny. You I mean, could start writing songs for us yeah, uh, yeah, because most of, most of what I write that's uh, that's really funny is stuff that you don't want your uh, grandmother or your kids to hear that's <laughs> like, hopefully it just goes right over the kids heads grandma's head no, she'll be like hey did I hear that right <laughs> my brother and I well, wrote a song gonna... one time and it was just <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess we're going to have to come up to put in Bane here some of those there you go yeah, absolutely yes. there's one song that I play that's banned from every single bar well all but two of the bars but yeah it's banned from well, you have to bars. let us know those two so we can yeah, hear yeah it. it's uh, uh, it's it's called My Last Ride on the SS Filthy Horse. <laughs> it's just, just a little idea of what it's about. It's, it's all sounds, it's double. Sounds it's, bay. it's all double entendre, and it's I don't actually swear in the song, but it's about a boat, and it's a. Uh, it's on, uh, and everyone wants to ride it. And no, no, you don't want to ride that boat. Uh, take my word. <laughs> Well, so, Bill, it's been phenomenal yeah, to have you on the show. You. Uh, it's been a pl yeah. pleasure for me to be here. Thank it's you so for the invitation. so informative. I can't... Uh, uh, we could go on. these When we have like incredible people to interview, our shows are like way too short. Yeah, it's like these breaks just happen. Boom, boom, boom. And <laughs> um, before you know it, it's over. But uh, we definitely will get you back in the fall. Thank you. And yes, uh, I can't wait to, you know, to find out what's in this book. The new book. We yeah. can't wait. just a awesome really great show it was really incredible i hope everybody enjoyed listening to bill as much as we did we could have went on and on and some of the conversations and stories we had while we were on break was just hilarious he he does so much he the the guy i don't know how he has time for everything yeah i don't either and uh, i find it amazing on during the summer months he's a park ranger at uh Putin bay 
and he's a musician. It's uh, you know which we discussed. So uh, anyone around here, I know I'm looking forward to going up and, and seeing him uh, play and perform um, on stage in Putin Bay and uh, actually getting a tour of the island. Paranormal Road is always uh, you know interested in going on those outings, especially to Putin Bay. Especially if there's wine involved for Randy. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do <laughs> to put on a good show. And uh, speaking of shows, um, we have one more show left for our first season of Paranormal Road. We, we truly, truly hope that you have enjoyed listening to this podcast series. Uh, it has been an honor and a pleasure uh, to bring this to you. We know that, you know, we started off a little bit rough and we're probably going to have to really, uh, over the summer months, uh, fine-tune to, to bring you a, a better show. That's our ultimate goal, goal to do. And uh, But again, we just can't thank you enough for tuning in and, and listening to us ramble. And we appreciate it so much and continue to send in any information, any questions you have. We're still going to be doing everything throughout the summer except actually recording we want to spend most of the time trying to find new content for the next season line up people for interviews and and just give you the best that we can give you we do plan on uh, attending a few incredible events uh, a bigfoot camp out and outing and uh... imagine that a bigfoot <laughs> outing well, you know, it's not like I'm really interested in it or anything. No, you have no desire to know anything about Bigfoot. Can't wait. But uh, we definitely plan on doing a Bigfoot um, excursion and actually going out and doing an investigation uh, with Amy uh, Boo from BFRO. I'm kind of excited to do that. Uh, also in Ohio coming up here uh, in May, uh, May 4th, is the Ohio Bigfoot Conference at Salt Fork State Park. If you're within the you know, area uh, of, of at least a reasonable drive. It is certainly something you want to check out. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's actually rated, I think, where it's listed as one of the largest uh, Bigfoot conventions in, in the state. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. And speaking of Bigfoot and cryptids. <laughs> Again. A little, <laughs> uh, a little teaser. We hope, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but we hope for our last show we will be having a show dedicated to the dog man with some incredibly creepy information that's sure to uh, make you howl at the moon. As usual, if anybody has any interesting stories to share with us or any information for us for upcoming episodes, please, please feel free to let us know by contacting our, our uh, program director, Lewis, at... You can do it at podcast at evpmediums.com. Again, just send an email to podcast at evpmediums.com. Or the quickest and fastest way is just log on to Facebook and send us a message to Paranormal Road via Facebook. And, and again, if, uh, if, if, if you would like to be included in, in the show, in a future show, your stories, we'd be honored to have you on. If you have stories to tell, uh, it would be just a... Uh, Again, our pleasure uh, to let um, our listening audience hear your story. And also, if you just want to send a comment, whether you like us or you don't, you can <laughs> <laughs> please feel free to share, and we'll, you know we'll talk about it over the show. Yeah, hopefully you do. Um, also, if you've missed a, a show on Odyssey One. And, or friends, particularly if uh, you've listened to the show and wish somebody else could have heard it, they can. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, same name, Paranormal Road. Our shows are posted after our live presentation on Odyssey One. They are then posted the next day on podcast. And for those with uh, Android-based phones, you can pick it up on Podbean. If you like tonight's show, if you're into the ghost, if you like reality-based uh, paranormal shows and, and true investigations, then uh, you, you should check out our YouTube channel at EVP Mediums. That's YouTube EVP Mediums. When we do an investigation, we post all of our video documentaries on YouTube, and they are free for you to enjoy. We also have our website, evpmediums.com. And again, uh, we have 
um, our investigations that are posted there as well. We have some pretty interesting content. Okay, David, stop babbling and let's get on with it. All right. Thank you for joining us on the Paranormal Road. Enjoy. Enjoy.